Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. Here we go. Hey, Chris, welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. Uh, thanks for having me, Warren. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is going to be good. Dutch Clark, I think there are several football fans or, you know, a lot of football fans who have heard of Dutch Clark uh, and just as many who've never heard of him. But even those who have might not know just how good a football player he was. So let's start off with a really big question. If you can give me a brief synopsis of who Dutch Clark was. Okay. Uh, uh, I think we, you look at, I think last year with the NFL's 100th season, I think he fits in with that discussion of who might have been the greatest two-way player of all time. And, and Dutch would be on that short list. And that would probably, like you said, would surprise some people uh, that his name would be up there. But when you look at what he did, um, you know, I, I believe it was six all pros in, in his seven full seasons and, um, you know, won a championship with the Lions. And it was just a great all around player. Uh, I think he's in that discussion of, of probably, you know, the, the three or four names of, of the greatest two way players of that era. It's tough to compare, you know, to, to the fifties and the six and to, to, to today's players, you know, for, with those two way guys. But, um, so just to put in a brief sort of, you know, little analyst, uh, analyzing him is, is that he, he's probably the most well-rounded gifted two way player, you know, of that era, you know, of that first probably two decades of the NFL, you know, he could do everything. He could, he could run, he could pass, he could kick, he could punt, he could play defense, and uh, he could be uh, probably the greatest leader uh, you know, um, that was on on the football field. I, I know there was a quote that I remember seeing on Dutch of by Clark Shaughnessy, the uh, the old college football Hall of Fame coach who was uh, instrumental in the T formation. He said if um, if Jim Thorpe, uh, George Gipp, uh, and Ernie Nevers were in the same backfield with Dutch Clark, Dutch Clark would be the general. You know, wow. that's – that, that's wow. how he thought of him. And so, you know, uh, so it's sort of that sort of brief thing is he was probably like, the, he's one of the three or four names I think is up there as probably the greatest two way player of that era. Yeah. We'll get into it throughout the interview of just how great an athlete he was and how um, I think, you know, everybody says you just can't turn it on after you've turned it off. You can't just walk out onto the field and turn it on. And if you really consider the kind of career that Dutch Clark had, he was that guy who could just walk out there and, and turn it on. Um, why do you think Dutch Clark is so important when discussing the history of professional football? Well, I mean, when, when you talk about uh, elite players, you know, uh, I mean, uh, when you look at to today, you know, you're going to mention, you know, the Tom Brady's and the Adrian Peterson's and the J.J. Watts, you know, these guys who are will go down, you know, even 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, you're going to know them. You're going to know the name. They're going to be enshrined in, in, in Canton, Ohio at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And I think that's what makes Dutch you know, so important is because he, he was one of those elite players, you know, I, I, you can make that argument. Like I said, he, he's maybe the greatest all around player of those first 20 years. I mean, first 20, 25 years where players were going both ways, you know, offense and defense, he he's in that argument of being one of the three or four greatest players, you know, um, you know, even though, like I said, some fans now might not quite know how good he was to even recognize his name. He's not, 
He's not, you know, Jim Thorpe or Red Grange or, or uh, you know, Bronco Nagurski. These names that are synonymous with some of the early years are two-way players. You know, Dutch it should be right at the top of the list. So that, I think that's what makes him an important figure in, in NFL history. Chris, you wrote the book, Dutch Clark, The Life of an NFL Legend and the Birth of the Detroit Lions. Where did your interest in Dutch come from, and why write a book about him? Uh, that's an interesting question, Warren. I appreciate it. Um, uh, I, I, can, I'm, I can sort of admit that I didn't plan on writing a book about Dutch. Uh, I, I had written a couple of early books about early pro football um, up to that point. Uh, I had known of his career. I, had, I knew he was a charter member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Um, and I wanted just to do a little bit more. I was looking for a new project to write about. And I was like, you know, um, and at that time, this is probably around 2010, um, I had located Dutch's, he had, uh, you know, uh, uh, two sons that were still living and two mm -hmm. stepsons. Mm -hmm. So the two sons intrigued me because I was like, oh, wow, this is a first generation, you know, uh, people that could talk about him. And when I uh, introduced myself and said I was interested in maybe writing uh, about their father, they were really generous in their time and the material. So it, it sort of took off from there. And I was equally impressed by the family as much as of Dutch's accomplishments. I, I Going in, I thought I knew you know, uh, enough about him. Like, oh, wow, he, you know, Hall of Famer, Charter member. But he was much better player than i expected you know I, you know sometimes with some of these early stars they were built up in the media you know mm -hmm. you know uh, or were written about more than footage you know well nowadays we can watch every tom brady game of his whole career um but there's not as much footage of, of some of these guys from the 20s and 30s and 40s and 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 even if you read about them, but the more i read about them, and then some of the footage that i was able to find on dutch just I was more impressed that he was better than I thought. He was better, you know, you know, you know, finding oral history, you know, you know, opponents talking about him, you know, teammates talking about him, especially opponents and, and opponent coaches. They just raved how good he was. And, and that sort of impressed me when I did the book is that Dutch was much better, much better player at the start of the project or at the end of the project than it was at the start of the project and um, was very impressed by how good of a career he had. And like I said, you mentioned like how important he was to the NFL, uh, which was sort of, it's still under the radar. It was still, you know, maybe not quite as, as maybe at the level where he should be, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where did his athletic talent come from? I mean, this guy was a stud at football. He was a terrific basketball player, you know, track and field. He threw the discus, ran the high hurdles. And while he didn't maybe excel at baseball, he did wind up playing a little bit of baseball in college. Where did all that talent come from? I think he just he just was motivated. I, I think there's, you know, some of these guys who played in the, in the two-way era, I think they just love sports. And it was definitely at a time where, you played them all, you know, you, you, you didn't specialize, you didn't, you didn't play baseball for 12 months around, you know, or, you know, you played soccer for 12 months, like, like maybe you do now. Um, they were, they just love to compete, you know, you know, so, so the Red Granges and the Dutch Clarks, they would play, you know, three and four sports, you know, and mm -hmm. they would just, and I think that helped them, you know, be great athletes. You know, I think, you know, you know, Dutch playing basketball, you know, playing track, playing a little baseball, it just helps you overall to be in this great athlete. And and then you work on it when you get to the, you know, especially once you get to the professional level, you know, then all that stuff pays off, you know, you know, the hand-eye coordination, the speed, the quickness, um, you know, reading about Dutch, Dutch worked at it, you know, almost all year round, you know, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you know, he, you know, had some, some, some jobs here and there, you know, as you always do, but, you know, he wanted to keep active and he worked at it. So, you know, when you played in the, in the, in the winter, you played in the spring, you played in the summer, it paid off, you know, um, 
you know, d- you know, down the road there, you know, as a professional football player. So a lot of these two way era players and, and Dutch was one where you just worked at it. All the different sports helped you become a great athlete, you know, cause you're working on skills, you know, like I said, hand eye coordination and, you know, speed, quickness, you know, just your, your, you know, your thinking and that type of stuff. That's how he became such a great athlete. Mm-hmm. You know, the easiest positions to, to measure on the football field are those that you can compile a lot of statistics. He was a kicker, as you said, a punter. He was a terrific tailback, a terrific quarterback. I mean, this guy was nothing less than spectacular on the football field. What were his strengths at tailback? What were his strengths at quarterback? Well, uh, I think when you watched him, when you watch him on film, especially, um, uh, the thing that stood out most, especially from the tailback position, was his feet. He had tremendous feet. Uh, he never stopped moving, you know, uh, and unlike some players of that era, when you watch them, they, you know, a lot of the action was at the line of scrimmage. Obviously, you didn't have the spread offenses, you know, the single wing or, you know, T. A lot of the action was at the line of scrimmage. So, you know, a lot of carries were for no yards or negative yards. But when I watched Dutch, his feet were always moving. I don't think I ever saw him get tackled for like a negative game. You know, it was always you know, three yards here, four yards, seven yards, you know, first down, first down. And then he would run for 10, you know, uh, he, he wasn't the, maybe the breakaway threat, although he had some speed, you know, that maybe like, like red Grange was before his knee injury. Um, but he feet always moved forward and always going forward. And it was very impressive because a lot of times in those days, it was a lot of, it wasn't even three yards of cloud of dust. It was just, you know, at the line of scrimmage, zero gain, zero, mm-hmm. zero, zero. And then you might get a five yard run or, or a lot of punts on third down because of field position. You want to, you know, field position battle, but Dutch, I think his feet uh, along with his vision, you know, were, worked very well together, you know, of him always moving the ball. Cause you could tell he had, the athletic ability that some of the tailbacks didn't have, you know, you know, a lot, lot of, a lot of, you know, movement, you know, with his hips and, and stuff, but his feet were very impressive. Now as a passer, um, he was, uh, somewhat accurate, you know, I mean, I, you know, some, there was one year where he completed, you know, 55% of his pass, which at that time, I think most quarterbacks were completing like 30%, mm-hmm. you know, one year where he, you know, he, complete about 50 percent 55 percent of his passes um uh he didn't have the the tightest spiral you know maybe like like a sammy ball did or or benny friedman but he, he could be um very effective as a passer um and then uh you know punting was good and his other skill that was probably elite was as a drop kicker you know which during his career was starting to get phased out a little bit, you know, with, with place kicking, mm-hmm. but he was one of the last great drop kickers, you know, very accurate, you know, you know, for extra points and field goals. Um, so, so definitely, you know, like I said, to, to sort of summarize, I think his feet and his vision was probably the best of anybody in that first couple decades. Obviously you studied the game particularly of that era. What was it like playing quarterback during the 1930s? How obviously different than today, but can you paint some sort of a picture for us of what playing quarterback was like and and what was expected of a quarterback? I mean, it's not like they were going into these games throwing the ball, you know, 30, 40 times. You know, the the year that you said he completed 55% of his passes, I'm looking at the stats right now. It was 53.5%, so you were darn close. And, you know, he started six games, um, appeared in 12, and for those games, he was 38 of 71. So, again, you're not throwing, you're not throwing, um, sorry, I just got distracted. My daughter's in college. And mm. she just sent us a note that her building is on fire. <laughs> I don't oh. even know what that means. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I just got distracted. Um, I was just mm. asking you about. Oh, here come all the texts. I know. <laughs> um, wow. Um, I, I apologize. That's all right. That's all right. There's yeah. So she goes to the University of Maryland. I don't know where I'm calling you. Uh, where am I calling you, Chris? Where do you Pardon? Live? Where Where do you live? Uh, uh I'm in uh, New Jersey. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, outside of Philadelphia, on the Jersey side. Oh, okay. My sister lives in Valley Forge. On the, you know, obviously. Uh, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah. So so what was playing quarterback like? Back during his era. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was different for for each team. Uh, in general, yes, uh, most teams did, didn't throw probably more more than you know you know twelve or fifteen times a game, and the lines were, were probably a little bit stingier than that. <laughs> um, Patsy Clark, who was their head coach, was real into the running game, so so they might only throw you know you know six, seven, sometimes you know, eight times a game. Um, so yeah, that's why Dutch is, that's what's impressive, uh, you know, uh, but he was still much more effective than some of the other quarterbacks who were throwing a little bit more, you know, uh, but for the, for in general, it was a running league in, in the twenties. It was all about the running game. Mm -hmm. Uh, the thirties, it opened up a little bit more because of the rules changes a little bit uh, of opening uh, the passing game, you know, for the NFL. Uh, so there's a little bit more passing in the thirties. But it was still a predominantly running game. Um, but like I said, for Dutch's Lions, you know, there were times, you know, he might only be asked, you know, to maybe throw from his, whether it's from his tailback position, you know, you know, you know maybe seven or eight times a game, you know, um, uh, you know, because they ran the ball so well uh, uh, at at times they didn't they didn't feel like they needed to throw where the Packers might have threw, you know, 12 to 15 passes a game, mm -hmm. you know, with Cur with Curly Lambeau. So, um, so it's definitely uh, up until, you know, it still took a little while for the passing game maybe to overtake <laughs> the running game. But definitely in the 20s, definitely throughout the 30s, it was mainly a running game in the NFL. What about in college? Now, he went to and played for Colorado College, and he certainly made his mark. And there he was the first team quarterback and was the first All-America from any school in Colorado, again, as quarterback. What was playing quarterback like in college? Was it any different than it was in professional football? Um, no, it was still a predominantly running game in college. Um, now, for Colorado College, when Dutch played, they did throw the ball uh, maybe a little bit more, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, maybe like ten, ten times. You know, ten, you know, in double digits, they probably threw more than the Lions did. Uh, they they tried to use that to also because everybody was geared to stop Dutch Clark. Dutch Clark was a a a starter. You know, you know, from his sophomore year. You know, where were freshmen were ineligible at the time. Mm -hmm. So when he was, when he was a sophomore and junior, especially his junior year, uh, they would game plan to stop him. So they opened it up. They they threw a little bit at Colorado college. Uh, but he was still all about, you know, the game plan was, was to run Dutch Clark. And um, yeah, he was, uh, you know, the best player that come out of that state, you know, uh, it was a real surprise. There was a uh, sports writer for the Associated Press named Alan Gold, um, who was based out of New York. Uh, he had heard real good things about Dutch Clark and, and he did his research and, and he put him on his first team all American squad. And he actually got criticized for it. You know, it's like, cause nobody knew where Colorado <laughs> was. They actually didn't know Colorado college. They got it confused with the university of Colorado. People still think that Dutch went to the university of Colorado, but no, it was Colorado college, which was even smaller. <laughs> and Alan gold got criticized. Like well, who's this Dutch Clark and where's Colorado college. And <laughs> um, so when Dutch, started playing in the NFL, he used it as motivation. He, he always thought that, that he wanted to sort of reward Alan Gold to say, you know, I wanted to see if I'm as good as I thought I was or what, you know, you know, Alan Gold thought I was. And that's what motivated him a little bit. He said that in several interviews that I found where he used it as motivation to, to, to see if he could prove himself in pro ball um, and in the NFL. So, um, and then Alan Gold was sort of, um, 
you know, rewarded for that. And everybody's, you know, sort of, you know, gave him credit for sort of finding Dutch and, and putting him on the first, because nobody else pretty much had him on the first team except, and, and he was Associated Press. That was probably about as big as it gets, um, you know, outside of, 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 um, of water camps, all American team, the mm-hmm. Associated Press was a huge honor to be on, on the first team and, and Dutch was, and, and the, uh, and, and gold was the one that found him. So uh, it was always a really good story for Dutch to, to be honored that way. Mm-hmm. And he was a bull. I think it was his junior year or senior year. He it was his junior, it was junior year. He yes. 10 yards a carry rushed mm-hmm. for, you know, 1,350 yards or something like that scored two over 200 points. I mean, how just how good was he in college and yeah. and did he play any other sport in college yeah i mean he was he was great i mean uh uh it, it, the conference that they played it was denver university and some of those schools like that out west so a uh, wyoming so so it wasn't it wasn't like he was such a man among boys but he played like a man among boys in that conference so um so he was very impressive, and obviously he was. He was a great athlete. You know, you know, he turned out to be you know one of the you know charter member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So mm-hmm. he was a very great athlete, and he did play multiple sports uh, um, at Colorado College. He played basketball. He was track. Um, he didn't play as much baseball there, uh, but but he earned uh, you know four letters in track or three letters in track, three letters in in basketball, and three letters in, in football. Wow. You know, so. Uh, and, and I think he got one or two in baseball. So, you know, it was, you know, it's almost like 12 letters in college. And that was only for three years. Like I said, he was right. there. Yeah. Freshmen were ineligible at the time. So, uh, you know, he was a tremendous app. I mean, you could still, I mean, he hasn't played, you know, college sports in almost, you know, 90 years or whatever. And he's probably still the best athlete to ever come out of Colorado College, you wow. know. So, wow. you know, and, that, and that's very rare at this time that, you know, for guys you know, like that, to, to still maybe be the best ever athlete to, to come out of Pacific, you know, high school or college. So, mm-hmm. You know, during my research and reading about Dutch Clark, one of the conclusions that I came up with, and I don't know if you feel the same way, but I get the feeling he really loved the college life. I mean, <laughs> don't we all? He wound up staying and later coaching. What can you tell us about his college days, if anything, that made him so love the college life? Well, I mean, he—I think when, when you're when you're young and you're coming up and, and you love sports, you you want to be around it and you want to play it for as long as you can. Even back then, you know, in, in the late twenties, you know. Uh, he just wanted to keep playing sports. I mean, you know, was that or the mines or the railroad in, in Colorado? So, you know, you know, his mom was a big supporter of him going to high school, you know, and then going on to college um, because the, the work that he was going to choose were going to be, you know, you're working in the mines or you're working, you know, on the railroad. So, um, so I, I think he liked that. I think he thought, hey, you know, athletics was maybe a way he could make a career. And he did for the most part. Uh, you know, you know, he coached uh, after you know, he coached in, in the NFL and then he coached uh, in college, you know, uh, was coaching, um, was head coach at the University of Detroit mm-hmm. and athletic director for a while, you know, uh, for a decade or so. So I think he just used athletics to, hey, look, this is what I'm. And now we see it as a positive. You're passionate mm-hmm. about sports. You're passionate, you know, about playing or coaching. You can make a career, and, and that's what he did. So I think that's why he liked – and he liked college probably just as much as the pros, although he was an NFL coach for several years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, I, I think he liked teaching kids. You know, I don't think he liked recruiting. <laughs> I think that's why he gave it up at, at, at some point. But he didn't particularly care for recruiting, especially at the University of Detroit. You had to compete against, you know, Michigan, Notre Dame and, and, and Northwest yeah. and Northwestern and some of the Big Ten schools, and you just weren't going to win those battles most of the time sure. to get players. So, uh, but he was just like I said, he was a, you know, he loved athletics, he, he loved sports, and, and he wanted to to make uh, make it in there. Mm-hmm. So after his playing days at Colorado College were over, he decided to stay. 
and work there as an assistant football coach and serve as the school's head basketball coach. So I have two questions here. First, why stay and work as an assistant football coach and not pursue a professional football career? And second, tell us about his exploits as the school's basketball coach. Yeah, I mean, at that time, I mean, pro football wasn't, still wasn't as popular as today. Like, automatically now, you know, most All-American players are going to say, hey, I'm going to go get drafted. I'm going to go play in the NFL. Um, you know, but back in, you know, in, in 19, you know, this is 1930 when he graduated, um, that wasn't the first option, you know, you know, you know, uh, for, for, for even All-American players or even players, they're like, you want, know you know, some went and played pro ball, some went into, you know, into the business world. So he, you know, at that point, you know, he, he was, uh, he got married the same day he graduated from college. So he married his high school sweetheart. So he was married. He was going to need a job. Um, so he saw uh, that his uh, school, you know, because he was the most popular athlete to ever come out of that school, uh, even especially at that time, they saw it as a recruiting thing. Hey, look, you know, because I think it was University of Colorado or um, Colorado Mines was looking to hire him. There's like, well, we don't want our best player coaching at a rival school and, and kids going to that rival school. Mm -hmm. So, and he thought it as a first good step, you know, um, uh, as, as, you know, being able to support his wife and, 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 and be able to make a living. So he, um, he agreed to just be an assistant under uh, Bully Vandergraaf was the head coach, was his head coach there the entire time. And then he could coach, be the head coach of basketball. So he decided to do that, you know, uh, which was a, probably a good move for him at the time, you know, because it gives him you know, support and, and he's still learning and he's learning, you know, stuff about the coaching aspect of, of the game and stuff. So, um, so that's probably why he did it at that time, you know, so, uh, uh, and, and then he sort of, you know, got the, the itch to play again, and, and that sort of came around. <laughs> yeah, so now he did get the itch, and I need for you to give us a history lesson, Chris. The Portsmouth Spartans. Who were they, how good were they, and who were some of their stars? Yeah, Portsmouth uh, had a, a very good um, sort of, you know, you know, football background, you know, down in southern Ohio. Um they had some semi-pro teams that were uh, very competitive. Actually, Jim Thorpe played for the Portsmouth uh, Shoe Steels <laughs> uh, because there was a lot of shoe, uh, shoe uh, manufacturers in Portsmouth that sort of sponsored uh, teams. And um, uh, so they had a tradition of fielding pretty competitive teams. Um, and then the Spartans just came out of that. You know, they played in 1929 as an independent uh, still a semi-pro team um, and then got the itch to join the NFL in 1930. You know, they thought they could compete with, with some of the, the bigger teams, you know, uh, uh, that the NFL were fielding. Um, and they did, you know, they, they were, they were a competitive team in, that first year in 1930. Um, they were led mainly by a, a halfback uh, by the name of Glenn Presnell, um, who was a Nebraska All-American who had uh played um locally there you know after leaving nebraska he played for the ironton tanks but they had um uh you know fizzed out because of the great depression so um so presnell was there um and then they hired potsy clark uh in 1931 um to run the team you know uh mm -hmm. Uh, and Potsy was a, a guy who had been around the block uh, for, for several years. He had coached at uh, several major colleges. He had not coached in the NFL at the time, but he had a really good uh, mind. Uh, he played at Illinois under Bob Zupke, who, who, coached, who coached Red Grange. So he had a very good football mind and, and was going to try to make the Spartans the, the next step. And, and this is where Dutch comes into play because Potsy – Dutch might not have played in the NFL if it wasn't for Potsy Clark's connection to Dutch. Uh, Potsy's uh, brother, Stu Clark, was actually the head basketball coach at Denver University. Mm -hmm. And he had and he had watched Dutch destroy Denver on the football field and, and you know for for three years. And he 
and he and he sort of went to his brother once the brother got uh, well, once Patsy got the head coaching job. He's like, hey, I know of this great halfback, you know, the single wing tailback, you know, quarterback that could play better than anybody. I think you you should see if you could sign him, you know, because Patsy had some halfbacks, had some linemen. He had uh, signed uh, Pop Lumpkin. He had signed Claire Randolph, the center. Um, Harry Ebden was a good in. So he was building a good um, front line. He just needed sort of a leader to 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 run the the show, and 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 his brother told him about Dutch. So Dutch, you know, wrote or um, Potsy wrote Dutch Clark. Um, no relation, said, correct? No relation. Yeah, no relation. Yeah, and uh, he wrote to him, say, "Are you interested? You know, he's going to pay him. You know, you know, uh, I think it was one hundred fifty dollars or two hundred dollars again. You know, it was a very good amount mm-hmm. for that time and for that small town. You know, the." Um, and then um, I think it was one hundred forty dollars a game his his first year in thirty one and and Dutch was very interested in playing because like you said he wanted to see if he was as good as his press clippings especially against mm-hmm. the best in pro football and uh, so he des- decided to go to to Portsmouth to play um, in the NFL so uh, so that's how Potsy got him but Potsy built a, a very good team there uh, in Portsmouth yeah so you've already answered my next question, which was how did he wind up with Portsmouth? Yeah. (laughs) But tell us about his immediate impact on the team. I mean, they went 11 and three, his first year, he led the league in scoring with 60 points. That's nine touchdowns and six extra points. And he was the first team all pro quarterback. I mean, wow. What an impact. Tell us about it. Yeah, it was, uh, Definitely from the get go. I mean, you know, once he learned Potsy's system, you know, which came pretty quickly, um, you know, after the first game or two, uh, he was inserted in the starting lineup. Um, that just shows how great he was. I mean, he, you know, you know, they had built a really good line to help block. You know, Potsy was committed to the running game, and so they gave him the ball a lot. They they allowed him to, to pass and, and run, and, and uh, obviously he was effective as a, as a kicker, but um, and you see it, like you said, he was the first team all pro back that first year. And that's all based on, like I said, he was very productive, um, you know, with that team. I mean, uh, you know, that team went on to have some very good years there in Portsmouth in 31 and 32 and 33, um, almost went into championship in 32, but, uh, I, and you see it when when I did the research for the book, and you come across quotes from a, especially opponents. You know, you know, you know, people like Red Grange and Brock Garcia of the Bears. You know, Mel Hine. You know, of the Giants. Um, you know, you know, Cliff Battles. You know, of the Braves Redskins team. They all they always complimented Dutch, like they knew he was probably the best player. He's definitely the best player on the Portsmouth <laughs> team. And probably the best player on the field most games. So it, 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 they were definitely impressed by him. You know, obviously the media and like I said, being voted, you know, all pro, you know, his rookie year. And like I said, you know, leading the league in scoring, you know, he was he was always up there in, the, in leading the league in scoring. He led the NFL in scoring in three years, you know. Uh, you know, so um, he was very impressive from the get go. And those awards and those honors showed that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, this guy from Little Colorado College. But there was a catch with Colorado College as well. Um, He agreed to go back to the school as soon as the football season was over and resume his responsibilities as the team's basketball coach. A little cloudy here. That first year, did he actually leave Portsmouth before the season ended? If so, why? And how did that work out with all the parties? Well, well, he didn't do it his first year. His he, uh, when he when he when he signed uh, to play for the Spartans, uh, he gave up his uh, role as assistant football coach. They uh, they they actually slashed his salary, <laughs> but he was still committed to be the head basketball coach. So his first year, um, the season was over before the basketball season started. Oh, so okay. So he was able to do that in 31, but if you're getting to 1932, then that's where it became a big issue because at the end of the 1932 NFL season, uh, a a 
crazy thing happened where the Portsmouth Spartans and the Chicago Bears tied for the first place in the league. At that time, there was no championship game. It was one one league, and the team with the best winning percentage was declared the champion. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1932, the, the, the Bears and the Spartans ended with a, a, a you know, uh, the same record, you know, uh, it's, they like had six, two and four or something. Well, like the that. ties were not considered in the record like they are now. Okay. They were, they were, so they were both six and one. So, um, so what happened was the two teams in the league agreed to play what is now considered the first NFL playoff game. And it's the famous 1932 game that was played actually indoors because of a winter storm in Chicago. Oh, yeah. And the field dimensions weren't yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're 80 that. yards. Yeah. 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 So that game was played indoors. But what happened was that game was never scheduled. So I believe it was December 18th, 1932 is when the game was played. Well, Dutch was already the, the, the season was supposed to already end and he was supposed to already be back at school coaching basketball. Well, the school, Colorado College, would not allow him out of his contract to play that game. Imagine that now. You get to the Super Bowl, and your employee won't allow you to play in the Super Bowl because, oh, you want, you, we didn't think you were going to make the Super Bowl in, in, you know, at the end of the season. Well, he was denied a chance to play in that game because he needed to be back, and he did. He went back to Colorado College, and he had a basketball game either that, that first week. And so he did not play in that ah. game. And, and – and the Spartans and Bears, and the Spartans held up. They played, it was a 0-0 game into the fourth quarter because of the confined field. But the Bears ended up scoring a touchdown and a safety in the fourth quarter and won nine to nothing. If Dutch played in that game, maybe that, that result becomes different. And Spartans actually become the NFL champion in 32. So so his role as as a head basketball coach did cost him his first big, you know, sort of chance at uh, of proving himself in, in that such of a uh, such a big game which now is considered the first postseason game in NFL history uh-huh okay so that clears that up and I mean yeah I mean 32 you gotta figure they would have had a better showing against the Bears had he played in that game I mean again he led the NFL in scoring he was named first team all pro quarterback and I read somewhere, and I can't remember where, here he has only played two seasons of NFL football, and he was named the NFL's best player for the previous 10 seasons. I mean, he was so good, so far and above everybody else. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's, and like I said, I think everybody knew he was that good, too. Like I said, opponents always praised him of how good he was and how hard he played and how smart he was. Um, you know, you know, you know, so I think that's always something that's impressed to, to, to find because obviously teammates are going to be a little biased at times. So, so when you read how teammates thought of them, obviously they thought of the world of them and they, 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 they would play hard for him. But when you hear opponents start to praise him, you know, you know, equally and, and, and to say, hey, look, if you had to beat the Spartans and then later with the Lions, like you had to stop Dutch Clark and that mm -hmm. was the guy you had to, that's the guy you had to stop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, here's where it gets a little cloudy for me. He was so darned good, but prior to the 1933 season, he decided to step away from the game, go back to Colorado and take over as head football coach of the Colorado School of Mines. Why give up professional football? And what the heck is the Colorado mm -hmm. School of Mines? I believe they still exist today. Yeah, it's still there. In, in the, <laughs> um, well, you, you got to uh, uh, understand that, the, you know, it, it was the early days, the early years of the Depression. So, uh, and you also got to remember that the Portsmouth Spartans were a really small town <laughs> of about 40,000 uh, trying to make it in the big leagues, you know, to field an NFL team. So the two years that Dutch played with them, they had a hard time making money. You know, um, uh, their home stadium wasn't that big, uh, Spartan Stadium, which is actually still there. It's one of the few early stadiums still there. Uh, a local high school plays there now. Wow. Um, 
Yeah. Um, so they were trying to, you know, pay their players. Uh, you know, Dutch in several interviews uh, later in his life admit that he didn't get paid for a couple games. So I think the as good as he thought he was going to get paid to not be able to get, you know, some of your money, you know, you know, uh, he, he didn't step away or miss any games, but he, um, you know, so I think that was part of it. It was like, Hey, look, I need a little more stability. Uh, I'm about to have a baby, you know, you know, you know, with, with his wife, you know, so he, um, so he stepped away just to have a little bit more of the stability, mm-hmm. um, you know, like I said, it's the depression. And, and obviously, you see after the 1933 season, the, um, you know, the Spartans were sold to Detroit. So they yeah. weren't going to survive very long because because of their difficulty of, 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 of funds and, 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 and raising money and stuff like that. They just weren't going to – Portsmouth, it's unfortunate because I think the fans there, but they would get seven, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 people for that town that was very big. But – when you're talking about, you know, Chicago's and New York's getting 15 and 20,000 people, yeah. it, it, came, it became harder to support the team and became harder for teams to say, well, we're going to go to Portsmouth, but we're only, they're only going to have 7,000 fans. Well, I can go play <laughs> in Boston and in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, which were coming up, and obviously Chicago and New York. Well, the Giants and the Bears were getting sometimes at least 15,000, 20, you know, 25,000 people. So, um, so it was unfortunate that Dutch – went through that but he decided to to go to um go back to coaching to be a little bit more stable in the money he was making yeah and it didn't go too well for him at the colorado school for mines i mean he went one and five in his only season with the ore diggers and then he went back to the nfl only now like you say portsmouth moved and we're now known as the detroit lions what happened with the ore diggers? And I'm sure the Lions were thrilled to be getting him back. What happened with him at the Colorado school? Uh, no, I, I mean, uh, they just weren't at the level as some of the other schools, you know, uh, I mean, Colorado college, university of Colorado, you know, uh, Wyoming, you know, some of those schools that were around there and near those conference um, just had a little bit more talent. You know, if you're going to the Colorado School of Mines, you're really going there to to, to get that education to work in you know in the field. You're not you're not doing it because you're a superior athlete. You know, if you're if you're a great athlete, you're probably going to the University of Colorado or Colorado College. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so he's probably a little bit behind the eight ball. You know, and then also I think he was distracted. I, I think you know he thought he was probably you know still still wanting to coach, but he you know there were several newspaper articles, you know, even starting his senior year uh, in college uh, of being rumored to go to the jobs, you know? So, uh, so we, you know, it was was almost the life of a coach and you're always being recruited to maybe coach somewhere else or to find a little better job or better players. So, um, so maybe, you know, his mind started wandering a little bit, uh, seeing maybe some of the talent he he might not have had. So, Mm -hmm. So after that one season with the Ore Diggers, he went back to the NFL and the Lions. And like I said early on, this is what I meant by he could just turn the switch on and go. It was as if he had never missed a beat. He picked up right where he left off, again, showing just how dominant and spectacular on the football field he was. He goes back um, for the 34 season was first-team All-Pro quarterback. He was second in the league in points scored, third in rushing, fourth in passing. I mean, he was phenomenal. Um, how was he able to step in and pick right back up like he did? Well, I think that happens with, with most great athletes. You know, um, you know, he was, he was still kept himself in shape. It wasn't like he was out of shape or anything. Um, but uh, – but you're right. You know, like I said, he, he picked up pretty much right where he left off, you know, with Portsmouth and he didn't miss a beat. And, you know, it came natural to him, you know, and, and Potsy, you know, you know, just gave him the ball like he, he trusted him, you know, you know, uh, uh, sort of gave him the keys to the car and, you know, he would he would run he would run it. And, um, 
Uh, and that Lions team was good. Like I said, they were – that team that he started in Portsmouth was, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves with the – you know, but it was a championship team. It was going to win a championship. Mm-hmm. And and it was built that way. You know, Potsy was coaching it that way. And, and Dutch was the leader. And, you know, they were eventually going to get over the hump. I mean, they – the 34 season, they started out 10 and 0, and they had what eight, eight straight shutouts to start the season, which is never that's <laughs> never happened, and it's never going to happen again. You're not going to get an NFL team that's going to shut somebody. You know, you can say the quality of play or whatever, but still, to shut out eight straight teams it's at the crazy. beginning of a, it's just crazy. So they just ran out of gas at the end of the year. You know, you know, with the Bears, you know, beating them. So and the Bears were a great team. They went on to win the first NFL championship in 33 and. Um, or in 30, 33 and 34. So, you know, it wasn't like they were that far off from, from being the best team in football and, and they had the best player w- with Dutch. Mm-hmm. Well, they didn't really lose a whole lot of steam in 35. And when you look back at Dutch's career, 35 probably had to be his most rewarding. The Lions won the West, and then they went on to win the NFL championship by beating the New York Giants 26 to 7. So, tell us about that 1935 season. Again, Dutch led the league or was close to leading the league in so many categories. And the Thanksgiving Day game against the Bears was probably one of his most memorable of his career. Yeah, I think when you when you look at sports and and, and especially you know, when you look at the NFL, there's sometimes uh, the previous year motivates you. You know, you know. So, um, so I think in '34 when they came up short, I think it motivated them. They're like, we probably should have played for the NFL championship. We probably could have won the NFL championship. So, so when '35 comes around, uh, they have that mentality to say, look we're just as good as anybody in this league. You know, we have the best player in Dutch Clark and, and they sort of rode that the entire year. You know, like I said, they were built, um, you know, the, the championship team was being built and they, and they proved it. And, uh, and I think for Dutch, obviously 35, you know, is the crowning point of his career. And, and that game, you know, just because, NFL films wasn't there <laughs> because if he was you his touchdown run in that game there's there's some new drill footage of it you know it's shot, it's shot way from the top <laughs> you know but his 46 yard touchdown run where he weaves back and forth you know he outruns and he outmoves the whole Giants defense on a 46 yard touchdown run in in the first quarter to put them up 14 to nothing that's his signature run. It would be like John Riggins in the Super Bowl against the Dolphins, mm-hmm. you know, or, or Lynn Swan's catch. Like it would be a signature signature play that you would always see, you know. Uh, and so, and that's how great he was. He, you know, he came up big in like some guys don't, but he came up big in that championship game, you know. Uh, and if you look at the stats for that game, they threw, I believe, three passes the entire game. You know, because they went out, they jumped out early, you know, and Dutch led that that 46-yard run, put them up 14 to nothing. Mm -hmm. They ran the ball almost the entire game because they knew that they had enough points with their defense that they were going to win the game, you know. And and Dutch delivered. Like I said, Dutch signature play, if you want to say, well, how great was he? Well, he had this great long run in the championship game against a great Giants team who – were the defending champs. They had won the year before in the, in the famous sneaker game against the Bears. They were the defending champs, and the, the Lions beat them, and, and Dutch Clark had a great day, mm-hmm. including the, the best run of his life. Yeah. Right, and speaking of the Bears and great games, Thanksgiving Day. Yep. They won, oh, yeah, that I was think, another 14 to nothing, and he had both touchdowns. Yeah, he. I mean, that's another thing that, that sort of elevated him, too, especially in Detroit was – um, because that was one of the things that the Lions owner, George A. Richards, wanted. He wanted, you know, this sort of marquee game. So he wanted to play on Thanksgiving. He wanted the Bears to play on Thanksgiving. And they had lost the year before 
but in 35, they got revenge and, and, and Dutch had a, another great day and, uh, and, and that sort of elevated the Lions because at that time, Detroit was kind of like the city of champions. You know, the, the Detroit Tigers won the World Series mm-hmm. in 35. The Red Wings had won the Stanley Cup, you know. So Richards didn't want to be in the back seat. So when they won the championship in 35, and, and Dutch was a big part of that, it elevated the Lions to like, hey, they're going to be on the front page of the sports page just as much as the Tigers and the Red Wings. And, and they were going to be this sort of fabric. Now, nobody in Detroit would ever think of, about the Lions leaving or not having Thanksgiving Day games in Detroit. You know, so so Dutch was a big part of that, you know, that early history and that early sort of, you know, mm. just having the city sort of, you know, love the Lions and become Lions fans. Mm-hmm. Chris, I got a funny question for you. Did Dutch enjoy the game? And and by that, I mean this. He had stepped away from it in 1933 and was threatening to do so again after the 1935 season. And he only played another three years, retiring after the 38 season at the age of 32. Did, you know, he stepped away once, threatened to do it twice, retired somewhat young at 32 did he enjoy the game playing the game yeah oh absolutely i i think when you look at players from that era i mean uh technically 32 is is very old (laughs) Uh, you know so guys only played like three or four years and then would go into business or go you know and, and do their life's work so to speak you know um so guys who played, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years wasn't quite as common as, as maybe you see today. You know, uh, even though today I think the average career is still about three and a half years. So um, I, I think it was more of, and you see it from players, especially who played in the in the two way era. They always wanted to retire, you know, because they were so beat up at the end of the year. They're playing sixty minutes, you know, or forty, fifty, sixty minutes. They're playing both ways, and you just want the season to end. And once the season ends, you, then you start feeling better in, you know, in the spring. Then you feel even better in the summer. And, you know, because Grange said the same thing, like, oh, I'm going to retire this year. Then he would come back and play, oh, I'm retired. And Dutch <laughs> did that, you know. And I think a lot of guys who who still love the game and, and, and still wanted to play as, as much as they could, they would go through that little sort of law and say, you know what, I'm going to, oh, no, I'm going to come back and play. And, and Dutch did that, you know. And, uh, and I don't think anybody held it against them. I mean, I think it was just the nature of, of, of what those two-way players did. You know, like oh, if you felt good, you wanted to play, then you came back and played. You know, because most of the times you just signed one-year deals. You did not sign four or five-year contracts. You know, like you do today. Mm-hmm. Um, it was always year to year. You're always tied to that team until you either retired or the team didn't want you back. So, um, so, so. I, no, Dutch loved football. He, he, you know, he was low key about it. He didn't toot his own horn. He, he didn't brag about himself. Um, but he loved football. Like I said, he, he you know, he, he went on to coach, mm-hmm. and he loved he loved going to games. And he, like even when he was retired in Detroit, he would go to the Lions games, you know, with his sons, and he would take his family to the games, and they would watch, you know. Um, because he's a little bit older, he would actually watch it till about the third quarter, <laughs> and then he would say, "Let's listen to the fourth quarter on the way home," because he wanted to be <laughs> that. But, yeah. but when you get when you get older, you just want to you know do that, you know, sure. uh, especially when you're dealing with fifty, sixty thousand people, you know, at Briggs Stadium, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. So, um, but he loved football. He was he was passionate about it, um, and, and just just loved everything about it. Mm-hmm. His last three years were good. I mean, again, he led the league in several statistical categories, although the Lions never got back to the title game. And in 1937, Potsy Clark left for the Brooklyn Dodgers. No, no, not the baseball Brooklyn Dodgers. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a team in the NFL called the Brooklyn Dodgers. So Potsy leaves for the Dodgers, and Dutch took over the job as head coach of the Lions, and still played full-time. I mean, this just goes to show how how well 
every how great everybody thought of him that he could do both. I mean, he was the head coach of the Lions while he was still playing. I mean, that has to be such a difficult task. And those first two years, he was still playing pretty much full time. He he sort of stepped back a little the third year. Talk about life for Dutch Clark as the head coach of the Lions while still playing. Yeah, it wasn't uncommon to have player coaches, but at that time in the late, sort of near the late thirties, uh, it was it, it was starting to be phased out. You know, you know, uh, definitely in the twenties, the, you had player coaches like George Hallis and, and Curly Lambo. But uh, so it was so it was starting to be a very unique. Yeah, I think it stretched him um, as as a player coach. But like you mentioned, uh, that team had a lot of respect for Dutch. I mean, Dutch even though they might have been close in age or the same age, you know, um, he was probably thought of more as, as a father figure, like a coach anyways. Um, he didn't go out drinking with the, with the guys quite as, you know, he wasn't, a, you know, a rebel rouser. So he got, a, he had a lot of respect and, and, and he knew the game. He was very knowledgeable. Um, I think the one thing that sort of, um, might be the knock on him as a coach, maybe not being quite as successful as he was as a player is that he was a perfectionist. You know, it, it was very tough for him to relay his knowledge or to, Hey, this is how I did it. I was really instinctive and really good. Why can't my players be at that level? Mm. You know, I mean, he, he, he was an all time great. So it's very tough to, to judge, you know, a player for not being an all time great. So, uh, because his overall coaching record uh, was probably around 500 or just slightly around there, you know, at time, you know, for the most part, you know, even in college. So uh, being yeah, a perfectionist, yeah. being a perfectionist sometimes doesn't bode well when you're trying to teach young kids or kids that don't quite grasp it as quite as much. So, but for the Lions, yes, you're right. They were they were very high on him. They they thought he was, you know. Uh, you know, great leader, and they were going to listen to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it must have been a little frustrating for him as a coach after the Lions. I mean, he loved coaching. He had to have loved coaching. I mean, before he signed on with the Spartans, he was a coach. He left the Spartans to coach in college, came back. Then he became a player coach for the Lions. Then he coached the Cleveland Rams and and was on the staff of the Los Angeles Dons of the AAFC and later the University of Detroit. What was it about coaching that he enjoyed so much? Well, I think it was just being around the game. I mean, uh, when you love football and you want to, and you want to be around it, you know, uh, after you finish playing, you know, coaching's the next best thing. You know, you're out on the field, you know, you got practice, you got you got camp, you got game days, you know, so it, it was, um, you know, it was part of his, you know, DNA was, was, was being a football player and then a football coach. So um, uh, I, I think he loved fundamentals. Um, there was a, uh, when he was coaching with the Lions and then with the Rams, there was a lot of articles that I found where he's, um, you know, he's given his sort of philosophy in his X's and O's and, and how to play the position. So, um, so I, I think he liked that. I, I think, you know, uh, uh, I think that happens with a lot of great players. You just like the X's and O's and, and being, and being around, you know, being on the field, you know, you know, being there for game day, you know, loving all that stuff. So, um, I think he enjoyed that, you know, like that maybe the results weren't quite like said, um, he didn't win like a national championship or, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. He was coach of the year in the Missouri Valley with the university of Detroit. Uh, one year he had, they had a very good year. So, um, but I think he loved just talking football, you know, just the X's and O's part of it, you know, you know, and most coaches do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think he was, I guess, if he looked back at his career, do you think he was disappointed that he didn't experience the same kind of success as a coach as he did as a player? No, I, I didn't get that impression, you know, um, you know, that, that he, you know, 
that he was disappointed or, you know, cause I think if you did that, then you might've kept going. Like he, he, I think he was content to say, Hey, you know what? Um, just playing, you know, you know, just trying to get out there and play and see if I'm the best or if I'm coaching to see if I'm the best. I don't think he strived for like sort of that white whale. Like I, you know, I have to win. I have to, you know, I got to win championship, you know, or I'm unfulfilled and stuff, you know, um, I think he just – he looked at it to say, look, I want to compete like he did as a player and I want to compete as a coach and then uh, – and give it my best. And, and then once he was done, he, he retired and, and stepped away. You know – I'm oh, sorry. Because he, he, de- he definitely could have coached longer. Like he, mm-hmm. he – when he retired from University of Detroit, he could have coached longer, but he stepped away. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Chris, I think one of the coolest facts about Dutch's career is that he was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in its inaugural class of 1951 and the Pro Football Hall of Fame in its inaugural class of 1963. He was a member of the NFL. He was a member of the NFL's All-Decade Team of 1930. And he was the first Lions player to have his number retired. He had such a wonderful career. So, as we close out today's show, I have three final questions for you. First, when you wrote your book, Dutch Clark, The Life of an NFL Legend and the Birth of the Detroit Lions, what surprised you most about Dutch Clark? Wow. Uh, No, I think what surprised me um, like I mentioned earlier, like I, it, it surprised me just how great he was. Like uh, I thought I, I, I knew, uh, you know, his career and stuff, but um, I definitely after, you know, doing the research and writing it, like I said, I would put him, I would have no problem if somebody said that he was the, the greatest two way player of all time. Like I, I would have no problem with that statement, you know, like mm-hmm. he was that good. You know, I mean, he was that influential and he was that good of of a player and, and what he meant, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, you look at, I mean, like I said, I, ha- I hate to compare eras so much, but, you know, I mean, you know, you know, Jim Brown did the same thing. You know, he, you know, dominated statistically. He won one NFL championship. Walter Payton did the same thing, dominated statistically and honors and opponents, and he won one. Super Bowl title like Dutch the equivalent did the same thing you know like he has all the honors he has all the awards you know his opponents respected him and he won a title like you know so um so in the era he played like I said you can't tell me like I said if you wanted to make that argument that that he was might have been you know the top two-way player of all time I would have no problem with that you know mm-hmm. um but he's definitely in the argument of the top three. So I think that's what surprised me to go back to your question. Like he, he was better than I, I, I even imagined how great of a player he was. Mm -hmm. All right. Why do you think, at least in my opinion, he doesn't get as much acclaim as others from that era, say a Bronco Nagurski or a Ken Strong or a Mel Hine or a Don Hudson. After all, he put up such spectacular numbers and led the league in so many categories. And again, in my opinion, he's just not as well known as those other guys. Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, that's when it was like I said, when I, when I did the research and, and then, then the book came out, I was like, I was hoping that that would help the cause a little bit to say, you know what, he deserves um, to be up there or on that mantle a little bit more, you know, just as much as the other players, you know, you know, it doesn't need to be ahead of anybody, but he, he needs to be in the discussion or he can be a part of that, you know, a part with some of those players. You know, and that's the reason why, you know, last year, you know, I was so happy, you know, that, that he was on that NFL 100 all time team mm-hmm. because he, he sort of seems to get lost, you know, and, um, so it's nice to see that, you know, maybe, you know, some people recognize, you know, how great he was, um, because I think he deserves it. 
how should we remember Dutch Clark? Well, I mean, I think it's like any player, <laughs> you know, you hopefully you remember him, you know, as, um, you know, as just this, this phenomenal player, you know, you know, whether it's, the, you know, the, the little footage we have of him, you could watch him or you want to read about him or how he established the NFL in Detroit. Like he's got, he has so many layers to his career. And, and like I said, he's, he should be up there with, with some of the all time greats, you know? Um, but uh, I, I think we're, we should remember is that like, especially, you know, uh, as everybody, you know, as football is such a huge part of our lives. And, and if you love history um, to sort of see, you know, how great he was and, and hopefully people remember, you know, uh, I mean, we didn't get into it. Like I said, he seemed to be a, a, a really good guy, took care of his family, mm-hmm. was su- successful in the things he did, you know, and, but as a player, you know, we should look at him as, as one of the NFL's all time greats. Absolutely. Chris, I want to thank you for taking time out of your night to join me on sports forgotten heroes and to talk about really one of the all time greats, Dutch Clark. Um, no, thanks for having me, Warren. Like I said, I I could talk all day about him. He's just such a, a, a tremendous uh, player and, and personality and, and sort of uh, has a niche in, in the history of the game. So, uh, so thanks for having me on. Absolutely, anytime. Mm-hmm. Hey, Chris, that was really good. Thank you so much. I hope, um, you know, uh, uh, I did the kind of research I thought I needed to do to – to elicit some great responses you gave them to me i hope you enjoyed this oh no it was great like i said i when you when you emailed me i i was a little excited like because uh because uh, i you get so busy i mean obviously you know everybody's got busy lives and we're going through a lot of other stuff yeah <laughs> um but just to get that because uh, when i look at some of these projects I, you know i mean that was eight years ago that that book came out so you you tend to move on and, and life goes fast and you're like you Sometimes you want to step back and say, oh, you know what? Um, it was it was such a joy to do that because most of these projects, you know, take, you know, sometimes two to three years. Sure. And, you know, so you live with it a little bit. And so to reach back and talk about, you know, my experience with that and, and to talk with you about Dutch, you know, like I said, so thanks for having me on. And thanks yeah, for asking. I, I, had ab- I had actually had hoped to have done this in person, but um... – the uh, uh, the conference, uh, the PFRA conference. I had hoped to meet you there and do this in person, but you know, obviously, because of everything, threw us all for a loop. Yeah. Are, um, you, are you writing anything else? Yeah, I'm working on. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I'm staying in the 20s and or 30s. <laughs> uh, I'm writing a, a biography on Bronco Nagurski right now. So. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, the the, um, the family, uh, the oldest son, uh, uh, has always wanted to see his see his dad's story in print, and he liked what I did with the Red Grange. It just came out last year. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But we talked, uh, just like you. He he actually came. He has a a, a granddaughter or a daughter uh, who lives outside of Philadelphia. So he came into the building in March, right before we were sent home, <laughs> he actually was here, you know, like eight or nine days before we were sent home. And, and we talked about the, the, the idea and stuff and, and he liked what I thought of, of what it could be. And so he's uh, sent me some of the research material um, cause I haven't been able to travel. So, sure. um, so he's been able to send some of the stuff. So, which is really good. So that's the next project, you know, it's kind of like Dutch. I didn't, plan to write about Bronco, you know, uh, I was thinking about something else and, um, uh, so it just pops up and, and you sort of run with it. And I'm, like I said, I'm excited about it. And, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, hopefully, uh, I think I have to turn it in at the end of next year or October of next year and it'll come out in 2022. So, Very cool. uh, so, Very so that's cool. the next, the next project on the horizon. Cool. Good for you. Hey, if you can, if you could uh, email me a picture, maybe three or four sentences about some of the stuff you've done or are doing, and I'll write up a little bio and put you on the website. So email you just like a headshot? Yep, and then that's all I need. Yep. A, a, yep. a bio. Okay. Yeah, yeah that'd short, be great. Short bio. Okay. No, that sounds good. I'll do that tomorrow morning when I get in. So Sounds great. Uh, yeah. Um, 
uh, so so you'll have it. And you don't have to track me down again. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, and I'll I'll email you the uh, the link to the show after I finish editing. I got to get sure. the stuff out about the fire. And it was yeah, my no, son's my son's apartment building in Arlington, Virginia, not my daughter's dorm room. Thank God. Uh, okay. So there you go. Well, he wasn't there. He, is it just? It's I don't not know. I'm, I'm going to find out after uh, okay. after I hang up. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah, life, life, yeah. No, never, never a dull moment. So. No, especially this year. Yeah. <laughs> so. Hey, Chris, okay. again, thank you so much. Thanks, Warren. Anytime. All right, we'll thank talk you. to you. Bye. Bye. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.